Hi, I'm Des Asante from the Tech Muse Podcast. Welcome back to episode, actually, I'm not entirely sure which episode this is going to be. I'm believing it's 66. Um, hopefully that doesn't change. If it does, I'll put notes in the, in the, in the show notes there. Um, and today we got, the, uh, we got the pleasure of chatting with Kathy Heller, who is a musician, a singer, songwriter, and who makes most of her living, from what I understand, in the licensing arena, which is something I'm very, very curious about. Kathy, how are you doing today? I'm doing excellent, and you're such a sweet, positive force. I watched you a few of your videos, and I was like, oh, I'd love to chat with him. Oh, so perfect. thanks for having me on. I appreciate you taking the time. I like having people on uh, that, are, that have knowledge in areas that are relevant to what we talk about here at Tech Muse, but are not necessarily things that I'm an expert in, which is a beautiful thing about being able to connect with people all around the world. Um, for, those of you, for those of my listeners who are not familiar with you, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your story? What, what are you up to right now in, in your career? Sure. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks. Everybody likes to talk about themselves, right? So yes. thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> I moved out to LA um, when I was 24. I'm 36 now. And I came out here like everybody else to be a rock star. You know, um, I didn't really know there was another way to make a full-time living at music. And so I came out here to, to, to pursue the dream of getting a record deal. And um, while I was in the midst of that, um, I was getting a lot of feedback that my songs worked really well for TV shows and films and commercials. And some of that stuff came my way. And I started getting songs of mine on TV. And I eventually started to realize that this was a place I wanted to focus most, most of, if not all, of my uh, creative energy. And so in 2008, I started full-time uh, working on licensing music and thinking about every single solitary way that I could be the best at it not only creatively, but also from a business standpoint. And um, that's what I do. I license my music. Uh, my music has been in commercials like McDonald's and Walmart and Kellogg's and uh, Hasbro and tons of TV shows like Pretty Little Liars and Criminal Minds and promos for The Office and NBC. And I'm so, so grateful. And I think it's pretty inspiring to people listening that you've never heard of me and yet I make a really nice living um, doing music. And so it's nice to be reminded that you can, um, there's something, there's definitely something between me and Katy Perry. You know, there's definitely something where you can do music and you can make not just a little bit of money, but a lot of money. You can make six figures, you can make way upwards of six figures year after year um, doing things that you love. And there's a way to figure out the best way to go about that. So I now not only license my own music, which I've been doing for a while, but three years ago I started a company licensing other artists' music as well. Since I had the relationships, I figured why not leverage that to help other people. And I also teach classes on how to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward in terms of your writing and understanding what the audience wants, whether you're pitching to film, you're pitching to commercials, you're pitching to trailers. And so we work from a creative perspective, and I teach online. I also teach in um, person in L.A. at two different theaters. And we bring in music supervisors from DreamWorks and Fox and NBC, as well as from ad agencies. And um, it's super fun. And I'm also a mom, and I have two kids. And I just try to juggle it all. And, um, and I love talking about this, so thanks for thank for letting me on. Oh, my pleasure. In fact, there's a number of things you mentioned there that I, I want to dig into because I'm really quite curious. Um, but let's let's wind it back a notch just to get the story started. Um, what, what's your background as far as being a musician is concerned? Um, obviously, you're a songwriter or else you wouldn't be right. licensing songs. <laughs> right. um, but what about your, uh, your musicianship? Your, you, you play instruments. Uh, when did that all get started? Yeah, so you're probably a run circles around me as a musician, um, you know, and that's another thing is it goes to show that um, if you're very resourceful and you know how to find the best people to put around yourself and you focus on what you're really excellent at, there's really nothing you can't do, right? Because you don't have to be a wizard at everything. So my musician story is um, my mom is a piano teacher and so I grew up with a piano teacher in my house and so I took piano lessons but I was playing, you know, the piano since I was tiny because that's what was going on in my living room every day after school was kids taking lessons. Um, but piano was not a place where I initially, um, I was good at it because I, I guess I had like a natural ability to connect to the music. But I didn't like find my wings there. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't taught chords. I was like reading music and doing classical music. 
And even though I kind of enjoyed certain pieces I played, I didn't find that as a bridge to becoming a songwriter, um, at least in the most like obvious way. Um, but the music was there, and I did a lot of um, stuff after school, like taking voice lessons and also doing musical theater. And then I did summer stock theater as a teenager, and um, that was really enjoyable. And I thought, I guess, for a while that I was going to um, be doing like musicals and grow up and like audition for Broadway shows. And then I realized when I got to college that um, I wanted to write my own songs. I didn't want to sing other people's words because I wanted so much to communicate certain things to people. And I, I didn't want to wait for the right script to come along to do that. And so I started writing songs at like, I mean, I was writing when I was little, but they weren't songs that I, you know, was showing to anybody except for my family. Right, and right. then when I was in my early 20s, I thought maybe I could write songs. And so I would sit down first with a lyric and then I would start to sing it. And then I would go to a guitar or piano and again, wasn't like so versed in the chords. So I would just try to figure out like what, what I just sang and then I would go to a producer and I would say, here's my lyrics and here's my melody. And the producer would say, all right, well, how about this as an arrangement? And I would say, cool. And we kind of work on it together. Um, and that's been, my, that's been my process. And I've just kind of honed, you know, getting good at what I'm good at, honing writing lyrics, honing writing melody, and then really figuring out who are the best producers for me to work with and um, trying to bring a lot of value to them so that they want to work with me. You right. <clears throat> that makes sense. So so you've really operated on a, a, a real from a real collaborative perspective, which I think is very, very cool. And I think it's something that that, you know, listeners should take note, because as you've pointed out, you don't have to be a, a master of all of the different aspects that uh, that surround not just music c creation, but music production as well. I was going to ask yeah. you a little bit about that. I was on your website earlier having to listen to some of the tracks. And uh, not only are they well written songs, of course, but they're well produced as well. So you must have, uh, you you know, you must have a team of reliable people with expertise in various areas to uh, to achieve that end result, I imagine. Yeah, no, it's true. And, you know, as you continue to grow as a, as a creative person as well as a, as a person, you you find better and better people to work on your team. You know, your ears become more sensitized to what really is great. And, of course, we only can begin where we are. And so 10 years ago, I thought the music I was doing was good, but I look back and you know it was kind of not as good as it, it could be now right because mm. I've grown so the producers I now work with I think are just better and better and um, examples of you know hopefully my best songs haven't even been written yet but yeah I think I've and I used to ask the right questions you know and that's all I think everything comes down to and people will say that being successful um, is only dependent upon resources you know well I can't be successful at this because I don't have enough money or I can't be successful because I'm not old enough or I'm too old or I can't be successful because I'm too fat I'm too skinny I'm I don't have enough time you know whatever the resources that they're missing but the truth is that your greatest resource is just being resourceful and um, I I definitely didn't have all of the resources you know when I came to LA I didn't have tons of money and tons of clout and tons of experience and a father who was a producer. I didn't have any of that, right? So I had to continuously build on being resourceful. And so, you know, one of the great questions that people listening could ask if they wanted to, I think at all times we should be thinking about who we can collaborate with who's a little bit better at what we do. Because if you're playing chess against someone who's as good as you or less good, you're going to actually be less good at the end of the game. But if you play against someone, if you're playing basketball against someone who's better, you're actually going to get better just by playing with that person. And so I used to ask the question, like, who would be the person I want to work with as a producer? And then I would spend time on Google and I would look at what artists are working with what people. And then, of course, there were people who wouldn't return my emails. And then there were a few who would be open to returning my emails, but then I would have to bring something to the table. I'd have to, you know, kind of show up with a lot of... Um, smarts and a game plan you know if they were going to spend the day with me as opposed to somebody who had more more on their resume uh, why would they want to do that well maybe because I was just like super you know excited and enthusiastic and passionate but also maybe I said you know well I, I'm trying to be resourceful and I'm going to come to you with a game plan I want to write this music for TV and I've already kind of figured out um you know what these shows want and so I have some lyrics and I, I think we have a good shot if you could produce the songs and again bringing the producer references, like what is the show listening to? Well, here's three songs that this show loves, and now just let the, let the producer absorb that. 
And it's amazing. I guess my point is it's, it's really simple to be resourceful. And it's amazing how many doors will open to you uh, when you when you just take no prisoners and you don't decide to be defeated. And you just say, like, I'm just going to like really approach this um, and ask the right questions and, and, and sort of leverage as much as I can and not, not necessarily have to have it all, mm-hmm. but, but, but need to... Um, but needs to just ask the question of what what would I need and who would I need, and it's amazing. If you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, you know, things seem to go the right way. Absolutely, yeah. It's like uh, th- I don't know who said it first, but there's a phrase that's bandied about that says, "If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room." And that harkens back to what you're talking about about you know trying to associate with people who have skills that are a little bit beyond where you're at, and that's what you're, uh, you're you know that's what you're going to be drawn towards as far as your own development, both creatively and otherwise. I imagine would be yeah. uh, the case. That's really interesting. <clears throat> um, yeah, you, you you touched on a few great points there that I think are important. To, to reflect upon. And, and the, the main one that strikes me is the idea of getting out of your own way, you know, and, and just, like you said, putting one foot in front of the other with a, with a point of focus, you have a direction that you're that you've decided to travel in. And you don't worry about that destination, you just keep moving in that direction, slowly, exactly. but surely, they say, how do you eat an elephant what, one bite at a time, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's really, really cool. Okay, so something I'm really curious about, obviously, which is why I wanted to have this chat with you is this whole licensing thing. So um, now, let me ask you, when you're, obviously, you're at a point now where I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine you're making most of your income through uh, sync license deals, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. So does that, does that affect your songwriting? Like, do you, do you still just sit down and get creative and express yourself purely and naturally? Or, or do you sit down with a real focus that sort of guides, you know, what you're going to write about, what chord progressions are going to be appropriate, what instrumentation, uh, maybe the producer helps with that. I'm not sure how involved you are with, you know, do we put piano here? Do we put a ukulele in there or whatnot? Um, does, does, this, does this goal of, of getting licensed, does that inform all of your decisions for the most part when you're yes, songwriting? It, ab- it absolutely informs my decisions and um, it informed, it's been informing my, my songwriting uh, for 10 years. Um, and here, here's what's interesting. You know, most people... Um, when they first hear this concept of, you know, thinking about something to have in mind when they go into the studio to write, they, uh, most people will feel initially like there's some, some form of selling out that comes along with that and that there's something inauthentic about it. Um, and what's interesting and I think what's really important is we have to kind of figure out what the goal is. If you want to express yourself um, you can do anything you want, right? Well, if you want to express yourself, but you also want to fulfill someone else's vision at the same time, then you need to keep in mind what their vision is. You know, if you're Hans Zimmer or John Williams and you're scoring these master, beautiful movies that they score, they're not just going to sit down and write a score. They're going to sit with the director. They're going to look, go to what's called spotting sessions. The director's going to say, here's the, here's the footage. This is the scene where we need something. And he, he's going to take notes. And the director's going to say, we need tension here and ear and still be the incredible, authentic person that they are. But they're definitely going to try to support the vision. So if you want to license your music, if, that, if that's the goal, you're licensing your music to someone else's picture. You're licensing it to a film. You're licensing it to a television show. You're licensing it to an ad. And so a director is telling a story. And so you have to think about what that story is. But what's interesting to me is that most of the greatest stories that have ever been told are stories that are not just personal, but they're universal. So when I started being informed by inspiring uh, stories that other people were telling, whether it was a TV show or a film or an ad, I started to find aspects of myself that I so much wanted to write about, but never would have thought about. Because when most songwriters sit down at the piano or the guitar, they write about heartache, they write about breakups, they write about love that was lost or love that was found or love that was almost found but kind of fell apart. And every single record, every artist you've ever loved, if you go to their first record, this is what it's about. And this is what we all do. And it's nice because it's everybody's most intense feeling is the person that they loved or the person that got away, all that stuff. But when you really think about your life every single day, from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, 
if you're honest with yourself, the thing you're really thinking about is not that person, but it's all of the big questions you have about fulfilling your potential, about trying to make the most of time, about being overwhelmed that time is so, so short and so frail, about the um, destination you're hoping to arrive to, about the changes you're hoping to make, about the moments that you're trying to overcome a challenge. And that's what all of these stories are about. Yes, every yes. movie, every ad, every TV show, every film is about those moments. If music is in a scene, it's to underscore a moment like that. So what winds up happening is you actually tap into your bigger story. And it's, instead of writing about this guy that you broke up with, you actually start to, you're tapping into something even more authentic, which is what am I doing here and where am I going? And songs in shows, there's a really consistent amount of themes that get asked for. Um, and they're usually about these big pictures. And if anyone's listening and they're a songwriter, I would encourage you to have a song about home, to have a song about together and platonic kind of together, to have a song about change, to have a song about brand new. I feel brand new. Have a song about um, starting over or on my way or t- taking off. And... I get asked for songs like this all the time. And what I started realizing early on, I looked over a year of being asked for things. And I found 10 consistent things that people ask me for all the time. And so I started saying to myself, how can I write these songs and tell my story with a big picture hook? So it's like in the verses, you're still telling your story. And then in the the chorus is count on me. The chorus is we're good together. The chorus is let your color shine. The chorus is best day of my life. The chorus is I'm going to make that change. And all of a sudden now a director says, Oh, that's brilliant. That's exactly what I needed. Right? So, um, I absolutely inform everything I do by wanting to tell a bigger story. But at this point, um, I really become inspired by it and I, I'm grateful to it because it's very difficult every single day to come up with something to write about mm. on mm. your own. But if you have a goal in mind and now you, you can, you can, the truth is if you're a good artist, you should be able to paint something or write something um, that somebody gives you a prompt to write about. Yeah, And it's, yeah. it shouldn't only be like a freestyle thing and, when I was a kid, I read that book, The Fountainhead, and it's about two architects, and one architect only wants to build what he wants to build, and the other architect, who you initially hate in the book, is building things that other people want him to build, and the one who builds what other people want him to build kind of finds his way of making his own, st- his own art as well, mm-hmm. and he mm-hmm. makes money, and the other guy is starving. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, no, that's really, really cool. There's there's a couple of things you said there that I wanted to comment on. First, first thing is I don't believe in selling out this, this whole sort of artsy fartsy, you know, if I'm not starving, I'm not a true artist kind of thing. I, I think that's for the birds as far as I'm concerned. What we, you know, what we talk a lot about on tech music, incidentally, there's two, two main conver- topics of conversation. There's music production and music marketing. That's, that's kind of what we discuss here at Tech Muse. And as far as the music marketing is concerned, I mean, yeah, we're artists. Yeah, we like to create. We, we are creatives. But at the same time, we want to figure out how can we pay our, our rent and how can we put food in the fridge and still do our art. And if somebody pays me to play a piece of music or to write a piece of music, that doesn't mean I'm selling out. That means I'm cleverly figuring out how to get people to pay me and support myself while doing art. <laughs> right. And the other thing that I find interesting is that when when you, as you discussed, you're talking about writing within the, the confines of the storyline that a particular show or movie or whatnot may be interested in having, you know, having content produced for. Um, and, and to me, that makes me think of, um, I can't remember who it was, but there's a there's a modern day composer. Um, uh, oh, shoot, I wish I could remember his name. But anyway, he, he said that he is at his most creative under the strictest limitations, you know, so if, if, if he was given, you know, the the criteria of okay you can only use three chords and you know you you know and I want you to write about this he would be at his most creative because he has to figure out how can I pack as much of myself into this piece under these strict limitations it makes me think of blues music you know blues music traditionally is three chords in the truth you know one four and five 
and a, and a blues scale, right? And yet there's been years and years and years of hundreds and thousands of blues players that all have their own different feel, their, their different soul and, and, and sense of creativity, yet they're all operating more or less under that, those, those same sort of strict limitations. And I think that's very cool. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you think about, you know, artists who are just starting out might have this idea in mind. But when when an artist does get a record deal, there's 15 people in the room at all times weighing in on what that single needs to sound like. There is no music you've ever heard or I've ever heard, which was which was marketed by somebody else, right? Which which had a big push behind it that didn't have input from a whole team, okay? So initially, sure, you're going to start out with your authenticity and somebody's going to take notice of that, right? That's how you're initially going to get your foot in the door. But eventually, people are going to come along and help you hone that and help you find a way for everybody else to also hear it. And it's the same thing with anyone you look up to, even in any other arena. Like if you think about a basketball player who's phenomenal, I mean, the game is so limited in terms of what they can do. And so the moves are the same, but what they bring to it is makes all of the difference. I yes, mean, all yes. of the difference. Mm -hmm. But it's exactly, I mean, they're so limited. You can't go out of bounds here and you have to stand from here and you have to, you know, this is a three point, this is an out of bounds. And yet it's their, it's their skill, it's their talent, it's their heart, it's their charisma. And next thing you know, like, they are a star, but they're doing exactly the same thing. And the millimeters of the jump are even the same, but it's how they jump and it's who they are and what they bring to it. So why on earth would an artist, you know, all of a sudden be above all of that? You know, like, oh, well, I write music, so I don't need to worry about, I mean, Right now, you know, Sarah Bareilles is, she just uh, was nominated for like a few Tonys for writing this musical. She wrote a Broadway musical and, um, you know, that's an incredible opportunity for a songwriter. And she started out, you know, waiting tables in L.A. and playing at clubs that I used to play at. There's no doubt that there was a team of producers on that project who very much informed the music that she wrote for that show. But I absolutely believe that it's her heart and it's her soul and it's her gift that is what's made that Tony nomination because she listened to what they wanted and she conveyed it, but through her. And that's all that really matters. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think it's, it's high time that people get out of their own way, as you said, and start to figure out like, what if I could actually buy a house, mm -hmm. you know, from doing music? <laughs> Wouldn't that be the most awesome thing? So how, how can I do that? Yeah, and I think for a lot of people, it's uh, it, it seems like a pipe dream. It seems like, oh, unless I get that big major label contract and I'm playing on stages in front of 60,000 people and, and, you know, I'm the next Beyonce or whatever, that, that it's a pipe dream. I think a lot of people, a lot of musicians, although they may not want to admit that, that that's the thought in the back of their mind that right. causes them to, uh, that prevents them rather from taking the steps needed. So I really, I really like this. Uh, I find this conversation rather inspiring. I appreciate it. Oh, you're so <laughs> sweet. Like, I find you inspiring. Honestly, I watched your video and just like your presence is very, um, there's like a default level of happiness that you exude. And I, I think people can feel that. Oh, good. <laughs> hey, so another thing too, my, my, um, my lovely lady, her name's Carol Channeling, uh, her and I write and record and perform together and, and we just call ourselves Des and Carol. And, um, and so we're, we're, and we're both fairly new when it comes to songwriting. I mean, I've played music all my life, but, uh, and I've written some songs peppered throughout the years and whatnot. And, uh, and for her, she's really only over the last few years, three or four years, sort of gotten into picking up an instrument and writing songs and doing Doing things outside of you know singing in the church choir and whatnot so um so songwriting is a topic of conversation that we're really interested in and the other thing that we're trying to do now along with some of our musical endeavors is we've started a podcast called um fearless creative and so it it's it's possible that perhaps we could have another conversation in the future on in that context sure, um, no problem. yeah because i like your style and i like the things you have to say on the subject of of creativity and sort of being fearless and and, and just putting yourself out there there. Um, uh, on that on that point, and on, along this whole music licensing conversation, um, how did how did this get started for you? Like I was I was doing a little reading up on you, of course. I like to sort of educate myself a little bit, and and I understand in the beginning there was a lot of sort of cold calling and and just the hard, raw, gritty door knocking, almost you know that kind of, that kind of salesmanship. Um, it, how did that get started, and 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 sort of what was the progression to where you're at now in terms of? I imagine now you have relationships 
relationships with people that you right. can then revisit. And so it's perhaps a little easier. Would you would you agree? Oh, yeah. No, definitely. Once a relationship is fostered, it's definitely easier. You know, when I very first started, I had an agent who was making those calls for me. I think the article you're referring to, there was an article in the LA Weekly. I think it came out in 2000. Um, when was that? 2000. 12? I don't know. I'm not entirely sure. Okay, so that was then. And then um, Billboard magazine wrote this article about me in 2013 um, when I had had some success, you know, m more success. And and then uh, Variety magazine was nice enough to write this article about me uh, this past August, you know, talking about, you know, where it all led to and whatever. But my, I should first give credit, before I started pitching my own music, I had agents pitching my music, um, and that's really how it started. But, okay. but before that, it actually started before that because what happened before that was I came out to L.A., I took meetings. You know, everybody in L.A. wants to have a meeting. It's so funny. You'll have people in L.A. who have done nothing, actually really tangibly nothing for two years, but they'll always think something's about to happen because they have a good meeting, great meeting, had a great meeting, great meeting. And like people take meetings with like people in the industry and then you're like, well, what happened? I don't know. I had a good meeting. So... When I first came out, I was having all these good meetings, you know, with record label people, and they would they would find something, you know, I guess uh, there was something uh, potential. There was enough potential in what I would send that they would have a meeting with me, and then they would all say to me, "So, you know, your music sounds like it's really um, it's really uh, perfect for TV and film and this and that." And I would say, "Okay," and I would kind of just like look at them. And in two thousand and eight. Um, I met with uh, president of Atlantic Records, Craig Kalman, and he said to me, oh, I really love this one song you did, and um, I think it could be like a soundtrack, and maybe you should meet with a music supervisor that I know, and you could help write the soundtrack to this new movie that's coming out, and then I could put it out as your record. And so I had a meeting with her, and I started realizing that I was going to do what we talked about before, where I was going to go to the studio and be informed by storylines. And so I started being calculated about it and creating music um, that came from that place. And I, I had an agent from 2007 to 2009 who was pitching my music, and he was pitching the, these songs that I would write from that point of view already, where I would send him songs that I thought could be good for picture. And he was my first agent who was doing licensing, and there's tons of sync licensing agents. And he got me... Um, on the map, you know, he sent my music out and it worked. People, people bought it. And so my first few licenses were American Airlines and Champion Sportswear and Kodak and uh, lots of TV and some Christmas movies and um, an NBC promo. And um, it, was, it, was, it was really a fun couple of years. Okay. And then he, he left. And this is when it all changed. He went to a publishing company, and I worked. I went to another agent, and they did a nice job, and they got me some a couple commercials and a couple shows. And I was sitting every day waiting for them to call. And I would make music, so that part I wasn't waiting. And I would send them music, and I would try to be a squeaky wheel and say, how can I get you to pitch me more? And they would say, we're pitching you as much as we can, but we have a huge roster. You know, we have 300 artists, and every artist has 20 songs. So there's thousands of songs. And so we're doing our best to pitch you as often as we can. And I started scratching my head and thinking, you know, if they're, if they're getting me things and they're pitching me once in a while and, and, and people are actually using it, right? When they finally hear it at Kellogg's, they, they buy it. I thought maybe I should just do what they do. You know, what do they do? It's not like they have to go get a, um, uh, you know, a master's to be a, a licensing agent. Why can't I do it? So I started asking those questions. Who would I need to reach out to? Well, I would need to figure out how to make relationships with the people who choose music for TV shows, movies, advertising, trailers. I said, well, I have a computer. I'm going to start making lists. I'm going to start making notes. And I'm going to start being my most politely persistent self and reaching out to people. And I, you know, I had a little bit of an advantage because I had the confidence because I knew that the music had already been well received through other agents. So I thought... You know, the music works. So maybe if I just put my heart into this too, and it wasn't easy, and everybody would say to me, how do you do that? Aren't you scared? Don't you feel like you're annoying them when you call them or when you send them an email? They don't know you. And of course, I'd be lying if I said, oh, I'm totally confident. You know, I was, but I just, 
I said to myself, you know, every person is an equal human being under God, right? Under the universe, we're all the same. And so if I'm just a nice person and I don't do like a salesy thing, if I just say like three lines in an email and I say something very personably, like, I honestly love the work that you're doing. And by the way, I would, because I wouldn't reach out to just anyone. I would reach out to the people whose shows were in, in sync with what I did and whose shows inspired me. Um, or whose shows didn't do what I did, but I just would well, I wanted to be on them. So it was it was actually very sincere, and I would say like three sentences. I really sincerely love what it is that you do. I know you get thousands of emails, so I really appreciate even if you've read this far. Um, you know, my name is Kathy, and I, I write music. And if you ever would consider it, here's one song, and I would send a song, like a link, not an actual MP3 because people hate that. Yeah, a link to a song. Mm-hmm. And I would not say, and here's four paragraphs about me. I wouldn't say, I've been on already legal, you know, Legally Blonde 2 and Kodak and American Ale. I wouldn't say any of that because it's not impressive. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. the only thing that's impressive is a person. And the quality of the work will speak for itself. And so filling up people's inboxes with pages of your own like bio, I think is very in. It's inauthentic, yeah. and if, if I were to meet you at a party, I would not go over to you and just start telling you all about myself because it would be weird. <laughs> you know? But I would say to you, like, where are you from? And I would say, oh, tell me about your girlfriend and how long you've been together and how did you meet? And then I would say, what do you do? And you'd tell me, and I would say, oh, me too. And that would be about it until you asked me, well, have you ever done anything I've heard of? And I would say, yeah, a couple things. And you'd slowly like pull it out of me. So I would never like just like do that. And I now as a person who runs a licensing agency, in addition to writing my own music and pitching my own music, I license for other artists. I get submissions every day. And people just some people are so kind and sweet and thoughtful. Some people's music is terrible. <laughs> and then there's a lot of people whose music is terrible and they send me emails that are so impersonal that I don't even want to read it because I can just tell it's like a blast. So yeah. I would send people emails and slowly, not quickly, but slowly but surely, people started writing back. And yeah. at first they would say things like, thanks, and that's it. And then they would say things like, just downloaded the song, pretty nice. And then slowly I'd get emails like, wow, that's a, sur- that's a pleasant surprise. I really liked the song. Um, who represents you? And I would say, well, I do. Yeah. <laughs> they would say, well, do you know all the business side? Like one of the main pieces of licensing in addition to the creative side is you need to be able to support business, meaning do you know that the song is clearable? Or is there a co-writer who has a publishing deal and even though it's such a great song, there's no way that publisher is going to clear the song for $6,000 for a TV show. Mm. So you have to be able to supply all the information and know ahead of time what the pitfalls are going to be, which is another way of asking the right question and saying, so who should I write music with? If you can help it, you should write music with indie artists who don't have publishers who are going to create a hurdle for you to clear. So if you have an artist and there's, there's a tremendous amount of talent in the indie world, um, you can find somebody who is your co-writer or you can write it on your own, but I ha- I highly recommend even if you're phenomenal to get over yourself and have a co-writer because even if the person changes one chord, to have a sounding board is like having an editor and it makes all of the difference. Yeah. So I, I have co-writers who I adore and they, I, I feel like they've helped me. Everything I've done, it's a team effort. Um, and so I would say, yes, you can clear the song. And actually, you can clear it today. There is no red tape. There's no label. There's no publishers. Mm-hmm. They would say, oh, that's interesting. And somebody once told me, if you want to be successful, don't look for opportunities, but look for problems that you can solve. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. In fact, I mean, there's a number of things as you were talking, I'm like, oh, yes, this and oh, yes, that. (laughs) And I don't know if I'll remember them all. But but one of the things I love is um, the attitude and the approach that you took in terms of, okay, well, I'm seeing that this agent is doing a particular job. Uh, the recognition that they were doing that same job for 300 other people and, and the, the obvious uh, um, also recognition that 
if they were doing that job just for you, you would probably be getting in front of a whole lot more people. And just by the pure numbers game of it all, statistically speaking, it would stand to reason that you would get a whole lot more business out of it. And then taking that upon yourself to figure that out. I think that's very, very cool. Um, When it comes to someone uh, who's, who's just perhaps learning about the whole world of sync licensing and wanting to get into it, do you recommend that they just get themselves an agent or use a service, you know, like Crucial Music or or any of these other um, organizations that that do sync licensing and, and shopping of, of music so, around? I'll tell you what, I mean, the honest truth is that most of the people I know who are extremely successful have mm-hmm. an agent. Okay. Um, okay. The people who are, I mean, who, I know people who are making, no joke, two to three million dollars a year doing sync licensing, and they have phenomenal agents. Ooh. Most people don't do what I do. They don't also do the agent part on their own. Mm. And it's because it's a tremendous amount of time and work that goes into that. And they would rather put all of that extra time and effort into making more songs, more songs, more songs. I think in today's market, it's a little bit different. When I started doing this cold calling and and emailing and and going to people's offices, first of all, I also live in L.A., which makes it easier to get in the car and try to set up a meeting and all those kind of things. Um, But aside from that, when I started doing this in 2009, uh, there were less people now, mm-hmm. right now, sync licensing has become, in fact, I just heard from somebody that at South by Southwest this past year, which was only a couple months ago, um, there was a panel on how to license your music to advertising, and it was the most attended panel. So, you know, when you have 50 other events going on at South by every day, and that's the most attended, you know that that's, a, that's the trend. So in today's market, um, I think what's happened is people have become a little bit desensitized to what's coming into their inbox and they delete a lot of things and they go to their relationships. They go to the people who they already know, who send them music, who pitch them music right, because right. it's so inundated. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that they won't listen. And I think if you're persistent and polite and personable and the music is good, you're going to get through eventually. So you could. But what I would say is the best possible way right now at this in 2016 um, I would find a person who has great relationships and a small roster. Mm-hmm. I would look for somebody who has credibility but not fancy people on their roster who are going to take up most of their time. If you see that somebody has a roster and there's like three famous people on it, even though that might make you more inclined to want to work with them, what that means is that most of their day, even when they're not pitching music, they're going to be listening they're going to be taking calls from people who want to just proactively call them and license the music of those famous people. And that takes a lot of time. And they don't have teams of 40 people. Nobody has that kind of money anymore. And in the sync licensing world, you're making a percentage of the sync fee. So even though I, as an artist, can walk away making a nice chunk, it's not something where you know these in-house teams are more than four people working on this. Okay, So if you have four people, you want four people who just have a good knack at doing this and a small roster. And then what I would do is I would become the most squeaky wheel on their roster. I would right, say, right. what every week I would say to them, what song do you need? What song do you need? In fact, I can give you a great example because I started doing this three years ago. And I brought on an, an artist. They're called the Highfields. It's a husband and wife. They're absolutely wonderful human beings. They're just so humble and they work so hard and they're so enjoyable to be around. They're very pleasant, just sweet people. And when I first met them, they had four songs. And I said, these are fantastic. Um, They had both been in bands prior to being together, and they had decided to work together. So they had tons of music, as was the case before they worked together. Now they only had a few songs. Well, since we started working together, every single week, whether they're sick, whether it's vacation, if it's Christmas, it doesn't matter. They say, what do you need? What briefs have come in? What calls have you gotten? What shows you're working on? And they've written probably 85, 86, 100 songs. Um, And so what's happened is the quality of their work has gotten better and better. And I then have a new reason to send them out every week. So even, you know, typically how it works on a licensing end is that I'll get about four to six emails a day. Hi, we're working on a documentary. I'm just telling you what happened yesterday. We're working on a documentary. We need something really empowering for the end title. Hi, we're working on an ad, and it's a, it's about travel for the summer. We need something about summertime. Hi, we're working on a um, TV show. We need something for the, the scene where the father is taking the daughter to college. It's like a smorgasbord. Mm-hmm. And so then what I do is I spend about 45 minutes per email like that, and I look through my, my catalog of artist music as well as my own, and I make a folder that I get. I put a link to, and I say, here's four songs that might really work for you. And they say, great. 
So that takes a big chunk of my day. Because if I get four to six of those a day, that's between four and six hours of work. Okay. Right, right, right. Then what I also do is when I have downtime is I'm trying to continuously make more relationships, right? So I'm reaching out to people who kind of, we once had that lunch, but we haven't followed up. So I, I remind them, or there's somebody that we talked about a show two weeks before, and I'm wondering what happened. And she says, oh, I'm glad you checked in. None of those actually worked. Um, we need, the director changes mind, you have this. So I do a lot of that. Right. Well, if an artist keeps checking in with me and sending me a new song every week, and even let's say every third week, it's phenomenal. I will proactively take another three hours out of that day and send that one song. And I won't send it as an email blast. I will send it to each person and say, Jamie, you have to hear this song. Mark, you have to hear that. And he'll just say, cool, thanks. And sometimes they'll actually say, you know what? That's exactly the kind of song I actually needed today. I forgot to mention to you. And so this particular group, the Highfields, when I met them, they had never licensed. And I can tell you today, we have licensed them to Petco, Living Spaces, T-Mobile, um, tons of TV, Jane the Virgin, other shows that you've seen, a Disney promo, ABC. Um, they just did a big spot for Payless. <laughs> and they, do, they no longer do another job. This is all they have to do because the licenses... And we can talk about that too, but TV licenses can be anywhere between like three and 10 grand, but an ad license can be anywhere between 15 and really more so 40, 50, even 80 grand. Wow. So <laughs> if you're getting three ads a year and a, and a smattering of a few TV things, you're, you're good to go. You're, you're doing basically, okay. Yeah. You're a lawyer <laughs> at that point. You know, you can make 200 grand a year easy. Wow. Um, so I would say my, my best advice would be, Find someone else who already has the relationships. And if you remember when I told you, I started with somebody else being my agent. And I was able to use the time where someone else had relationships and money started coming in. And I got 11 licenses in the first year. And we mentioned what those were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it allowed me to kind of build my confidence, build my repertoire. And then down the road, I had a little bit more name recognition from people. And then some people never heard of me. But I at least trusted that the music was in a better place. Yes, yes. Um, but I think you know you can find a great agent who already has relationships, and you can kill it if you really show up for that agent and don't just sit around. Yeah, one of the things the the morals of this particular story that I that I keep getting over and over again is, and I and I also believe that it's one of the sort of primary tenets of business in general, but it's all about personal relationships and rapport. I mean, people do business with people they know, trust, and like. That's almost a cliche phrase now in as far as the business uh, community is concerned. But it's absolutely 100% true. And if you are um, putting your best foot forward and making great relationships with people, much like in the first part of our conversation with getting your music produced, you know, you've made relationships with people to co-write with, you've made relationship with producers, uh, engineers, etc., Etc. to get the actual recordings uh, together. Um, and it's, it's really, it's those relationships that are the seed that the rest of the success sprouts from. Um, and, and I'm kind of hearing that across the, across the board during this conversation, which is kind of an interesting thing to point out. Um, and the other thing, okay, so, so you mentioned that uh, a good place for a person to start is to find somebody who has contacts and a, a, a roster small enough that they'll actually have some time to dedicate to, to what exactly. you're doing. Um, now, and then, of course, the, uh, the other thing is, is that this person, not only do they have relationships, but they have an insight into, I would, I would imagine, to giving you a little bit of guidance as to, you know, what you should be uh, writing about, what the quality, that's the other thing I wanted to ask you, the quality of the submission. Uh, do people submit demos or do they, is it better for them to have a fully produced recording, this kind of thing? And then uh, is, does that have an, a, uh, an impact on A, the success of getting a sync, uh, a license, and B, the, the value of it? Absolutely. And I would say that in today's world, you know, everybody and their mother has a laptop where they can produce things that sound pretty decent. Sure. So um, you're up against a lot of competition in terms of, there will be no demos submitted. If you're pitching to a TV show or you're pitching to a licensing person who's going to pitch to a TV show, she's already getting or he's already getting really high quality things. So if they're going to hear a demo, it's all of a, it's right away a no because time is of the essence. So if she has to get the songs in by, you know, usually I'll get an email and they'll say, 
I need this by four o'clock, right? So if I have three hours, I don't have time to turn around and say to you, it's a great, interesting song, but I need to hear the production. I have no time. So I just go, great, thanks. And then I move on to the other song that's already right. produced. So I don't really get a lot of demos. And the truth is that with the beauty of the internet, you can go on and I can give you some of these websites to um, look into for your audience. You can go and look at all the songs that have been used in every episode of every show. I can tell you how to find that. Mm-hmm. And you can look at all the songs that have been used for the entire campaign of every particular brand that you could think of. So it's very easy to know the information of what does this brand like? What does this show like? What kinds of songs? What kinds of production? Okay. And then you sit down and it's, it's actually uncanny today how much you can do with your own pro tools or with a producer who's pretty handy and a good engineer. And you bring that person a reference. They don't even have to have the vision. You can bring the vision. Say, here's three songs from the show. This is the palette. This is the kind of soundscapiness that they like. This is the kind of general direction they go in. Let's do this. And we've pushed songs through that have fake drums all day long and they sound phenomenal and yeah, I mean yeah. I, I happen to work with a producer who's a, he is a drummer and he's a fantastic drummer that's how he started so the percussion is excellent and I think that actually the drums are one of the most important components for picture because things get cut to the to the to the train feeling of something moving along and so if the drums but but it is incredible what I have heard come out of studios and it's like someone did that on their laptop and it really sounds like a close second. I can't even tell. Yeah. So if that's the case, you can't put yourself in a position where you're even leaving a question that you're going to be somewhere in, in second place. You need to have a good production and you need to ask the question, what does the production sound like? Well, what am I pitching for? Let me go listen. And if you want, I can rattle off a couple websites. There's one called Tune Find. Tune find. And if you go on there, you can search like all the series of shows, ABC, NBC, Fox, and then it actually takes you episode by episode. And then you click on, let's say, let's say episode three of Grey's Anatomy, season six, and you can see all the songs that they use in episode three, season six. And you can go okay. season by season and you'll go, okay, I, re- I get the point. Like you'll start to see that there's like a DJ on every show and they all like each DJ has like a thing that they do for that show. There's a, there's a sonic brand to the show. And, and this would say, be, this would be the music supervisor. That, that's their role. Exactly, That's their role. Yeah. And so you'd say, Oh, okay. Well, why would I ever pitch them this? This is what they like. So I'm going to pitch them this. There's certain shows that want like a moody, sexy, haunting, you know, sound. And there's certain shows that want like a hip hop, you know, in your face, sort of like, just party sound with so much vibe. It's right. a different right. show. Um, and then for brands, you can go, um, I'll give you a couple websites. There's a website called Splendad instead of Splendid. Splendad. And there's a website called TV Commercials with an S, Songs. So it's two S's in there, TV Commercials songs.com. Okay. And okay. it'll list like, these are all the sh- sh- um, commercial yeah. songs that were in uh, the Super Bowl this past year. These are all the, the 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 songs that Target has been using. This is a study on Walmart, what they like. So there are so many people who are interested in this, and they've already compiled all the information for you. Mm. So now you can say, "Oh, I want to pitch to iPad." You know, I want to. I want. I want. Let's say you're working with a licensing person, but you want to be a squeaky wheel. You're going to go online. You're going to listen to what's working, and you're going to say, "Kathy." I wrote three songs. I think these are perfect for Tropicana. Do you know anybody at that agency? And I'll say, actually, I do. I'll proactively pitch these. I don't know when their next campaign is coming along, but they should have these in a folder. So you can, you can be a squeaky wheel and you can think ahead and think out of the box. And it's not that difficult in today's world to know exactly what people want. And really, they want the, they want the same thing. Like yeah, they're always yeah. just looking for a replacement of the next of the last song because when it comes to a team effort, and if it's a TV show or if it's a brand, you have a director and a producer on the TV show making these decisions. So if the music supervisor knows the director likes this kind of sound and she has a small amount of time because every episode has like 10 songs and she's got to get those all done by the next Friday and the next Friday and the next Friday, she's got 26 episodes. So she needs like 260 songs. 
she pretty much knows what he wants. So she wants the same thing. And with the brand, it's even more the case because you have non-creative people. You have marketing and business people who are sitting in, in towers in their executive suites who work at brands and crunch numbers and they can't deal with out of the box. Right. It, in terms of like the music might be out of the box, but meaning if it was already focus grouped and tested and it worked, they want a song that's very similar to that. Yeah. So if you kind of make your own versions of being inspired by what's already working. Now you have to write your own melody so you don't get sued and you have to write your own lyrics so you don't get sued and you have to write something that feels truly authentic and the vocal has to sound like you mean it. Right. But pretty much you can kind of get a sense of what what they want. This is fascinating. I, like I say, this is a subject that I've been interested in, but didn't have a great deal of experience. I have a few friends of mine. Uh, one friend in particular, his name's Brian Weirmeyer, and uh, he doesn't have his website up yet, so I can't link it to it. Uh, but uh, he's, uh, this is what he's getting into, and him and I worked together for a number of years, and he was using a service called Crucial Music, which is why it came to my mind. I mentioned it earlier. Um, and he's got uh, uh, you know a song in an episode of The Ghost Whisperer and The Young and the Restless. and Now, those are... Uh, uh, those TV shows. Do you also get uh, when they when they rerun the episode? Do you get a little a little kickback again? Hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. You get so you get your royalties from being a writer. Mm -hmm. You get your royalties from being your own publisher, right? You get your publishing, your writer. But what's also super fantastic is that if you do an ad and the ad is SAG, Screen Actors Guild. Okay. Even if you're not a member of the Screen Actors Guild. The first three ads that you do, if they happen to be SAG, you will get SAG royalties. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because SAG royalties are about 25 times higher than the, than the writer's royalties are for, for the songwriter, whether you're an ASCAP or BMI or CSAC. Really? You can wind up making twenty dollars to $30,000 in SAG royalties a month. Who? Oh. Okay, I like the sound of that. That's very interesting. And now, that's why I tell people to pursue ads, because an ad is going to run not one time. If you're in an episode of The Ghost Whisperer, it's going to run. And maybe it goes into syndication, and maybe that episode gets run a couple more times. If you're in an ad, they're not spending $2 million on an ad to run it one time. No. <laughs> they're going to run that ad about 2,000 times a day across yeah. the country, which is why if it's SAG and you're getting paid every time it runs, you're doing really well. Now, this Screen Actors Guild is because uh, you're in America and I'm in Canada. So are there differences there? Or if, if, I, if I got a song uh, uh, licensed to um, uh, uh, an ad for an American company, does that qualify still even though I'm in a different country? Or do you know much about how that works? That is a great question. And since I've never lived outside of the country, I've never asked that question. And I don't have any writers who are uh, who I represent who are out of the country. So I don't know the answer. But I imagine I can't see why. It, cause I'll tell you why I can't see why you wouldn't. Because whenever I have filled out the SAG paperwork, there isn't a box that says, are you Canadian or French or, or do you live in Germany? It okay. just says what's the name of the person and what's their what writers association are they with so um i would ask, i would ask somebody else who would know that i don't um but a canadian who's already done this would probably definitely have the answer i, I can't imagine that you wouldn't get it okay i'm going to investigate that a little or and, and to see if there is a canadian equivalent etc cetera, etc cetera. and if i uh, if i find out some information i'll be sure to attach it to this post at yeah, techmusicacademy.com i believe this is tech Music, uh, episode 60 Five, I think. <laughs> so that, again, I'll confirm that later. And if there's an issue, we'll, we'll correct it. But um, listen, Kathy, this has been an awesome conversation. I appreciate you taking the time, but I do want to be respectful of it. And um, my bladder is also letting me know that it might be time to take a little break. But listen, I really do appreciate it. Where, uh, where can uh, my listeners and viewers uh, locate you and find out more about you or perhaps get in touch with you maybe regarding licensing or whatnot? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you can get in touch with me. My email is Kathy. My name is spelled with a C. So it's C-A-T-H-Y, Kathy, at catch the 
moonmusic.com. And I run an online licensing class. In fact, our next one is this coming Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. I'm also going to be starting one on Sunday evenings for a few people who've written to me from Britain and all other places where they can't get to me um, Monday Pacific time in the morning. And some people just have a day job. They can't do that. So I will, I'm teaching Monday morning online, but I'll, I will soon be teaching Sunday evenings. Um, I also teach a class in person in L.A. And if you email me, I can tell you how to be become part of this. And essentially what I do in this class is drill down on everything we just talked about and go into tremendous detail on what kinds of songs. And then we work on the songs. And then we talk about all the other ways to strategize about getting your stuff licensed. People can definitely call me. And if you have music that you think is great, and you want me to consider it for pitching, you can also always send me. And again, be persistent with me. Like, you know, I get tons of people. So use me as your first, you know, example of being politely persistent. And remind yourself that I get tons of emails, plus I have two kids and a life, right? So if you don't hear back from me, don't take it personally. It just means I saw it and I probably haven't listened to it yet. So in a month or three weeks, just write back, hey, I hope you're well, check it in. Um, I love it. Absolutely. I'll be around and thank you for having me. And uh, maybe some of you will, you know, we'll connect. We'll connect more. Yeah. And hopefully uh, we can do this again sometime, either maybe uh, under this context or under the uh, Fearless Creative podcast that has not yet gone live that uh, myself and my lovely lady are putting together. Um, I think you'd be a, a, an excellent person to, to chit chat with under that context as well. And obviously, KathyHeller.com uh, is where people can go and check out your music and see some videos and, uh, and catch all your news blurbs and find your Facebook and Twitter links and so on and so forth. So I recommend that people... Uh, uh, you know, connect with Kathy, and uh, and you know, if this is that's that's the, one of the beautiful things about the world we live in is we can just connect with people yeah. all over the planet. <laughs> you know, yeah. and as we talked about earlier, I mean, that's that's really really what it's all about. It's making relationships and developing rapport with people, and that's where business arrangements happen. That's where where yeah. success begins to to uh, to compound upon itself. Would you agree? Yeah. Well, it can't be said enough, and I think being genuine and having the confidence confidence to put one foot in front of the other is how you're going to continue to make those relationships. So I encourage everybody to not get bogged down by all the discouragement that's everywhere. But if you have something you love to do, and like me, every hairbrush was a microphone, and you just want to be a singer since you're a kid, and you want to write music, don't let things stop you and keep going because you never know what door is going to open because you had the courage to take the next step. Absolutely. Pick a direction, one step at a time. Kathy Heller, thank you so much for taking thank the time. You. So nice to meet you, Des. We'll talk again soon.